Good morning. Morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you for attending. We know that um, during this time, it's hard to bring people together because everybody's so concerned. But thanks to the social distancing protocols that we've established, I know that you're all going to feel safe. And we are all, all going to have a very wonderful event. And we'll leave here safe. Welcome to the Department of Economic Planning, e Economic Development, Transport, and Civil Aviation's launch of St. Lucia's country program to the Green Climate Fund. Um, we, we're starting without prayers this morning, and I'm hoping that um, Tommy will allow me to say a short prayer so that at least I'm not seeing it in the program. So please stand as we bless this activity. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here today. We thank you for this occasion today, this opportunity, so that the hard work of individuals, of groups, of stakeholders will be manifest today. We thank you for all the work of the ministry, the officials, and everyone who has been part of this launching activity today. We pray for success of this activity, and we pray that everything will work out to your glory. We ask that you bless these proceedings, and we give you thanks. We ask it through your son's name. Amen. That's it. Okay. So please allow me to go through the protocol list and allow me to welcome Honorable Guy Joseph, Minister responsible for Economic Development, Transport and Civil Aviation, Housing and Urban Renewal. Mr. Claudius Emmanuel, Permanent Secretary, the Ministry of Economic Development, Housing, Urban Renewal, Transport, and Civil Aviation. Mr. Orville Gray, Caribbean Head for the Green Climate Fund. Dr. Anika Grandison, and Senior Technical Officer and Project Manager, Caribbean Nat Natural Resources Institute, Canary. Mr. Tommy Descart, Chief Economist and Focal Point for the Green Climate Fund in St. Lucia. Ms. Donette. Shalri is the lead economist for Renewable Energy and the Green Climate Fund. Specially invited guests, members of the media, our virtual participants and audience, good morning. We will go straight into the program and we have opening remarks from the Permanent Secretary, Mr. Claudius Emmanuel. Please welcome him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Master of Ceremonies, Mr. Simon. Good morning to all. Honorable Guy Joseph, Minister with Responsibility for Economic Development, Transport, and Civil Aviation. Ms. Mr. Orville Gray, Caribbean Head of the Green Climate Fund. Dr. Anika Grandison, Senior Technical Officer of Projects. Caribbean National Resources Institute, Canary. Mr. Tommy Descart, Chief Economist and Focal Point for the NDA of the Green Climate Fund. Other invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, those of us following us on the virtual platform, good morning to you. I am indeed grateful to welcome you here to, on behalf of the Department of Economic Development, Transport, and Civil Aviation, which is the national designated authority, or the NDA, for the Green Climate Fund. We are here today for the joint launch of the Caribbean Green Lim Climate Fund country program for St. Lucia, as well as the Green Climate Fund Civil Society Organization Readiness Project. By now, we are all fully aware that it is well established that Caribbean Small Island Development States, or SIDS, face unique and intensifying challenges to climate change and natural disasters. Due to our geographic characteristics of being small, both in terms of land mass and population, as well as being located near the equator and in a hurricane belt. Despite our best efforts at pro-growth national development planning and policy formulation, we are constantly being reminded of the reality of a Category 5 hurricane hitting one of our islands and inflicting damage and loss of life and property on a scale of biblical proportions. 
At the risk of repeating what most may consider to be overplayed sound bites regarding the vulnerability of Caribbean SIDS, even when we contribute negligibly to the factors that have brought us to this point of global confrontation with Mother Nature, we must remain resolute as we have been thrust at the center of this battleground. The sheer exposure of SIDS mandates that we must continue to forcefully articulate our vulnerability to climate change, purely on the basis of survival in the now, as well as for future generations. Notwithstanding this monumental yet surmountable task, the global expectation is that SIDS must concurrently pursue the post-2015 Sustainable Development Goals. Indeed, the ongoing climate change threats have not abated, and amidst the lack of leadership at the global community, there is need for consideration of the fact that SIDS are on the edge of a precipitous cliff. However, the increase in frequency and intensity of climate change has hampered SIDS' ability to attain SDG goals, as well as meaningfully improve the well-being of their citizens. This is further compounded by the fact that our region is simultaneously experiencing a spiral in debt, which is to a large degree the result of previous natural disasters. This has resulted in increased public outlay on debt servicing, which narrows the fiscal headroom to respond to the socioeconomic challenges that are endemic to Caribbean SIDS. To adequately respond to these challenges, and have any chance of surviving, SIDS must seek to boldly build resilience at the individual, institutional, and private sector levels. A precondition to doing so lies squarely on the availability from the global community of resources that are concessional and accessible. I say this because it is my firm view that Caribbean SIDS, who on account of their development successes over the past four decades, measured by GDP per capita, have been penalized for growing and converging to development country status, which in my view is the ultimate goal from the beginning. We now face a reduction in the level of grants and concessionality of loans from developed countries and the Bretton Woods institutions, as set out in the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development Development Assistance Committee, OECD DCA eligibility criteria. Despite unanimous calls to embed vulnerability of seeds into this framework, our collective impassioned pleas have unfortunately been largely, have largely fallen on deaf ears. Notwithstanding this dire development prognosis for seeds, there is still hope. I see the availability of such resources as the Green Climate Fund, GCF, as an equalizer that can right the global wrongs that have been inflicted on SIDS. If in fact GCF funding can be mobilized at the right scale, terms and speed, its inclusion into the SIDS development assistance portfolios can lower the weighted average cost of capital, which simultaneously, that should be while simultaneously enabling them to build back better and limit the destructiveness of future natural disasters. It is for this precise reason that I am particularly heartened by the launch of St. Lucia's Country Program, which outlines an ambitious portfolio of national and regional projects, as well as readiness initiatives that St. Lucia will be involved in over the next four years. I am also happy to report as the NDA that St. Lucia was recently informed of the GCF's approval of our readiness number two, totaling some 662,000 US dollars which will further strengthen our climate adaptation and mitigation efforts. Equally, the NDA welcomes the launch of the St. Lucia chapter of the Regional Green Climate Fund, Civil Society Readiness, which is led by the Caribbean Natural Resource Institute Canary under the able leadership of Dr. Grandison. In closing, I wish to take this opportunity to thank all who contributed to this St. Lucia country program. I wish to acknowledge the staff of the Department of Sustainable Development, the Commonwealth Climate Finance Advisor, the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, the five C's, Climate Analytics, 
as well as all other agencies who provided input into this process. And of course, last but not least, I wish to acknowledge the staff from my own department who amidst a mountain of responsibilities have provided leadership to this process. So I wish the process all the best for the rest of the proceedings today, and I wish to thank you. Thank you very much, P.S. Thanks for your words. And um, you know, while he was speaking, he said SIDS so many times, and I, at one point in my life, didn't understand what SIDS were. So for those persons who don't understand what SIDS are, small island developing states. And he says that um, building resilience is something that SIDS must be able to do. Um, to help us build on this, we now have remarks from, and I forgot to acknowledge her in the beginning, PS in the Ministry in the Department of Sustainable Development, uh, Ms. Anita Montout, and she will now virtually present to us um, short remarks. Ms. Montout, can you hear us? Thank you. Good morning. Can you yes, we'd like to see you as well. I hope we could see you. Yes, well, I'm seeing the video says that um, you cannot start the video because the host has stopped it. So I'm oh. trying to put myself on, but I can't. Okay, so our able IT professionals will ensure that we could see you. Thank you. Okay, try again. Okay, I think we now have something. Uh, hold on, I am seeing my camera is not on. How do you turn this camera on? It's, it's showing that it's on. I'm seeing a desk. Yes, it's supposed to be turned. How do you turn it? One second, I'm trying to get it. I'm trying to switch the camera. What device are you using? Okay. Ah, oh, you got it now. Uh, you don't see me now. Okay. So just tilt it down for us just a little, and then you are on. So let us welcome Permanent Secretary in the Department of Sustainable Development to make her presentation to this um, event, Ms. Anita Montout. Thank you. Distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, those joining us in person and remotely, as the protocol has been established, I bid you good morning. The launch of St. Lucia's country program to the Green Climate Fund is a significant achievement to be celebrated by the Department of Sustainable Development as the National Climate Change Focal Point. It has been quite a journey and we are especially pleased to have support this process and to see it come to inspiration. There was a time when one only thought of the Ministry or the Department of Sustainable Development when the term climate change came up. But through joint efforts over the years, climate change is a language spoken by agencies with responsibility for water, agriculture, fisheries, infrastructure, education, tourism, health, external affairs, commerce, youth, finance and economic development, just to name a few. This is as far as it should be, as climate change is everyone's business. Through a, co through a collaborative effort, led by the Department of Sustainable Development and Energy Division, as the case may be, St. Lucia has developed and approved, among others, a revised climate change adaptation policy, a national adaptation plan, or NAP, 
an associated sectorial adaptation strategy action and action plan or SASAPs, a climate change communication strategy, a monitoring and evaluation plan, a climate financing strategy, a climate change private sector engagement strategy, a climate change research policy and strategy, a nationally determined contribution or NDC and associated partnership plan, a national energy transition strategy, the NEST and a green, a green School Nationally Appropriate Mitigation Action, or NAMA. Yes, it's a long list, but we are pleased to indicate that the Cabinet of Ministers has its seal of endorsement for each of these. I am sure the thought that policies and strategies mean nothing without implementation has just run through your mind and you are only correct to some extent. However, operational entities such as the Adaptation Fund and the Global Environmental Facility and the Green Climate Fund requires evidence of national alignment for proposals submitted. Specifically, the GCF requires project proposals to clearly describe how the proposed activities align with the country's NDC and other relevant national plans and how the funding proposal will help to achieve the NDC or these plans for making progress against specific targets defined in the national climate policies and strategies such as the NAMA and the NAPS. The GCF also requires project proposal to outline how they will develop in consultation with relevant stakeholders and action plans that I reference. Indeed, the Department of Sustainable Development is pleased to have worked closely with the NDA on the country's program to the GCF, which has leaned heavily on the NDC, NAP, and medium-term development strategy processes, among others, to determine our priority sectors, consistent with the whole of government approach that we must all embrace. St. Lucia's country priority are based on both adaptation, that is simply put any action taken to avoid, minimize, or address climate change impacts and mitigation, which is any action taken to reduce carbon emissions that cause climate change. The country's program touches the sector and areas of water, agriculture, fisheries, aquaculture, infrastructure, and special planning, resilient ecosystem, education, health, tourism, energy efficiency, electricity generation and transportation in the first instance, as well as a number of cross-cutting measures such as legal and regulatory framework, data and information management, capacity building, and raising awareness. We want to ensure that no sector or area is left behind. We take this opportunity in moments like this to remind everyone of the value of international climate change treaties, such as the Paris Agreement, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and the associated negotiation processes. It is through these processes that the financial mechanism and its operational entities, such as the Green Climate Fund, are established. The financial mechanism is accountable to the parties which decide through negotiation and consensus on its policies, program priorities, and eligibility for funding. St. Lucia and specifically the Department of Sustainable Development and other stakeholders continue to participate actively in these international processes. We hope to continue to collaborate with the NDE partners and stakeholders through the GCF pathway and otherwise. We continue to iterative, we continue the iterative process from planning to implementation to monitoring and all the steps in between towards building climate resilience and finding solutions that address both our current pandemic situation and the challenges posed by climate change. I thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Montut. And um, you mentioned something very right up front in your presentation that is very important for this activity here today. And you said climate change is everyone's business. And I think of the many stakeholders that we see around, we know that everyone is concerned about this, this piece of rock that we own and the rest of the world as well. Um, to tell us a, a little more about this activity today, we bring on Mr. Where is my list? Let me see my list. 
We bring on Mr. Orville Gray, and he is the Caribbean head for the Green Climate Fund, and he also will join us virtually. Mr. Gray, all right. So let me hear a sound check from you. That'd be really good. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Honorable Minister Guy Joseph, Minister of Economic Development, Housing, Urban Renewal, Transport, and Civil Aviation. P.S. Ms. Anita Montu, Department of Sustainable Development. Mr. Claudius Emmanuel, Permanent Secretary, Department of Economic Development, Transport, and Civil Aviation, and the NDA for GCF. Mr. Tommy Descartes, Chief Economist in the Department of Economic Development, Transport, and A Civil Aviation. Members of St. Lucia's National Climate Change Committee, Dr. Ainka Grandison of Canary, other representatives from Five Seas and Climate Analytics, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I offer greetings on behalf of the Executive Director, Mr. Yannick Blumerick, and staff of the Green Climate Fund. The GCF truly counts it counts it a privilege to be participating in the launch of St. Lucia's Country Program. This launch represents a pivotal milestone in St. Lucia's engagement with the fund. The development of this country program forms part of the implementation activities from St. Lucia's first readiness grant from the GCF, which was approved in 2018. With Five C's as deliver partner, Climate Analytics as consulting firm, and many of you present today among the key stakeholders who contributed to the elaboration of this document, St. Lucia is now one step closer to realizing its short to medium term climate action goals with support from the GCF. GCF places emphasis on country programs, a strategic guide for countries' engagement with the fund. The process must therefore ensure country ownership and demonstrate inclusiveness meaning that the identification of country needs is conducted through a robust national stakeholder consultation process, including the public and private sectors, academia, and at the community level, including civil society organizations, and considering environmental social safeguards and gender consideration for the entire development and implementation process. It should be diverse by integrating the various policies, plans, financing sources, and implementing partners which support the national climate change agenda, and should be focused by, re by presenting a prioritized pipeline of projects based on efficiency for outcomes and impact, through which the country will pursue its low-carbon climate resilient pathway. Ladies and gentlemen, with your support, the government of St. Lucia has been able to complete this critical step and for that, we commend you. There are many more steps to be taken along the journey towards implementation of St. Lucia's first GCF-funded activity. The GCF is assured that St. Lucia's NDA is up to the task of continuing to facilitate the attainment of that vision by continuing to build on the work from these initial readiness actions. Some of the steps already taken by the NDA include, one, moving towards the finalization of the Privileges and Immunities Agreement between the GCF and St. Lucia, which has benefit of facilitating GCF activities within the country, such as equity investment in the private sector. Two, creating pathways to allow St. Lucia to directly access GCF resources by facilitating efforts towards accreditation for both the St. Lucia Development Bank and the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. Eastern Caribbean States Commission. Three, elaboration of concept notes as a step towards full funding proposals to be put forward to the GCF for the water sector, energy, health, and the greening of infrastructure, such as the housing sector. And four, elaboration of a PPF to support a funding proposal aimed at unlocking the private sector investment needed to transform Caribbean productive sectors and energy systems by catalyzing a transformation of finance for which St. Lucia will benefit along with Jamaica and Belize. In addition, to, in addition, to date, St. Lucia has accessed $1.13 million from the GCF for readiness activities for two national readiness programs and one direct support to the OECS Commission. Following up on the first readiness program in 2018, 
The second readiness program was endorsed for approval on the 3rd of December 2020. Congratulations to St. Lucia on this achievement. St. Lucia has also supported regional readiness actions in the amount of $1.1 million, which allows for economies of scale and scope, such as support for enhancing Caribbean civil society's access and readiness for climate finance regional readiness, Sedema's early warning systems readiness, WHO PAHO enhancing climate change resilience of health systems in the Caribbean regional readiness, and strengthening the foundation of a climate responsive agricultural sector in the Caribbean regional readiness. As you continue to engage with the GSPF, the regional team stands ready, willing and able to continue its support to the NDA and the country at large. We look forward to celebrating with you many more milestones along your GCF journey in contributing to transformational climate resilience and low carbon development in St. Lucia. Once again, we offer our heartfelt congratulations on your launch today. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gray. Okay. So you, you mentioned, I think, from your presentation, I'm really understanding why we have so many stakeholders present. You mentioned the collaboration of the private sector with equity um, in the private sector investments. Um, you mentioned health, and I see my colleagues from health here. You, see, you mentioned energy. And so everybody is involved, as we said earlier, in this Green Climate Fund and the activity today, the launch of St. Lucia's Country Program. Somebody who's been very much instrumental in this and who um, I know this is very critical to him and part of the achievements that he would like to see is the minister. And he's present today to show his absolute support for this launch. And we'd like to welcome him to the podium, Honorable Guy Joseph, to give us some short remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Master of Ceremonies. Um, permit me to adopt the protocol already established and to join my voice with those who have gone before me in welcoming everyone here, both those who are here physically and those who are there virtually as part of this launch. Now, um, it's the Christmas season, it's the holiday season we are approaching. I see a lot of very serious faces. I know Green Climate and um, the program today is one that is very important. Um, but at the same time, it is the season of the holidays that we are going into. And despite all the challenges that we have faced in 2020, I think 2020 will go down in history as a year that brought extraordinary things to this world um, in terms of the general approach. But nevertheless, life goes on and we must do what we are doing. And so I am quite pleased as Minister with Responsibility for the Ministry of Economic Development, Housing, urban renewal, transport, and civil aviation. And another portfolio that I have that is never mentioned is that of telecommunications. For some reason has not been added to the list, but I still have that responsibility. I am pleased to welcome everyone to this special launch of the Green Climate Fund Country Financing Program. While St. Lucia and SEEDS in general, our overall contribution to global warming is minimal. Very low percentage. And if you take it island by island, then it becomes even much smaller, almost insignificant. Yet still, we remain among the most vulnerable countries being affected by global warming. And so we need to pay attention 
ourselves in terms of our behaviors, our conduct, and what we do. While we cannot control what happens in the bigger countries and how it is going to impact us, at the end of the day, whatever we can do to help control our own destiny, we need to do so, and we need to do so with haste. So I am quite pleased when I see initiatives like this one being undertaken. And I have to compliment the SLDB for being part. I see both the chairman and the manager being present here. It is a clear indication that getting you accredited to access funding through the Green Climate Fund and also the OECS Commission are steps in the right direction in terms of what we need to be doing as a country and as a sub-region. If we put hurricanes, natural disasters, and all of the impact of what we have seen over the last few years, you know, I, I remember, I think it was Tropical Storm Debbie, back in the mid-90s or early 90s, 94, and then we had Hurricane Thomas in 2010, when I was Minister with Responsibility for Communications and Works. I was told that it is one in a hundred year storm. But we had two in less than 20 years. And I was trying to rationalize well how we could have ended up with two one in a hundred year storms in less than 20 years. And if there was anything, and then you remember the Christmas Eve trough which came from nowhere and would fall maybe in the same category as some of the previous storms that we've had. As I address you today, we are still rebuilding from the damages done by Hurricane Thomas because some of the landslides are just being um, taken care of on the roads in a number of areas. Um, if I look at the Bacatel and the Foncodra area where walls are being built, there's still some that is not addressed. And if we go to the desilting of the John Compton Dam, we would recall that during the construction of that, it was when Tropical Storm Debbie hit and quite a bit of silt was deposited and some damage was done. The desilting of the dam has just started. So it tells you things pile up on us as a country faced with the challenges that we have. So according to the statistics, over the past four decades, the Caribbean has witnessed more than 250 natural disasters. Majority of them have been storm-related. During that period, natural disasters have claimed over 12,000 lives of persons within our region. So whether we are impacted directly or indirectly, livelihoods are affected, and over 12 million people have been affected during that time period. So for those who want to think that global warming is not a reality, for us in this region, we would know that that is not the case. It is indeed a reality. In fact, the economic impact has been very staggering. According to the IMF, the Caribbean region, the loss in damages have been to the tune of 19.7 billion US dollars in the form of damages done by natural disasters. 
And that is equivalent to about 1% of the Caribbean GDP being destroyed annually, every year. That is the level of vulnerability that we face. And that is why initiatives being undertaken, especially as that we are seeing by the Green Climate Fund, is very necessary, especially for small island developing states or seeds as we call them. You know, in reality, we are very small. We almost do not feature in the midst of all of the challenges. And to add, if we should say, to add insult to injury, the whole world got hit by the COVID-19 pandemic where everybody had to look internally now as to how they were going to survive and how they are going to respond. And while there is a vaccine, people are still just coming to terms with responding. We have not been spared in any form or fashion. In fact, while it is not a natural disaster as a hurricane, flooding, earthquake. But it has had a greater impact on the world in general than maybe any natural disaster of our lifetime. Because natural disasters usually hit a country, a region, a particular area. But this pandemic has been global in its nature. And so coming to the launch of this Green Climate Fund um, program, it is very important for us to understand what is happening and how it is impacting us. And that is wh why whatever little help we can get from these agencies and access to concessional funding, and I know PS touched on it briefly, but because we have grown and graduated to a certain level that is just based on your per capita GDP, which does not take into consideration the full impact of how your entire GDP can be wiped out in one night, as we saw in Dominica happening during the hurricane, we would understand our level of vulnerability and the need to build better and more resilient. But building better and building more resilient comes at a higher cost. And that is why we remain one of the highest indebted regions in the world. Because we are faced with all of these challenges. And I can just highlight for the benefit of those of us who are here and those who are following. If we take the Denry Polyclinic that we were in the process of building, we had to go back to the drawing board because these buildings must now be built with a certain level of resilience to earthquakes, to natural disasters. The St. Jude Hospital project also being built at a higher cost because of you have to build for resilience. You have to be able to stand a Category 5 hurricane. You have to be able to withstand a certain magnitude earthquake. And all of these, we have to now build better roads with better drains, deeper drains, wider drains, higher bridges, wider span bridges, all of that is coming at an additional cost. And as the Prime Minister always says, when you build a bridge taller or higher, it doesn't carry any more cars. It just costs you more. And what is being done by the Japanese in cul-de-sac will be an example, the JICA um, works that would be undertaken there, to help in the flood mitigation works that is happening. So the Green Climate Program 
is very important. Over the years, we have seen after the Paris Agreement, a lot of lip service was paid to a lot of things, but we are now beginning to see things would materialize and small island states like ours can begin to see tangible benefits from what is happening as far as dealing with this. And so I am quite pleased. Today's launch of the St. Lucia Country Program amidst the current COVID-19 pandemic is a clear testimony that the government of St. Lucia continues to relentlessly pursue its climate ambition regardless of whatever external shocks that we may encounter. Some people have been advising us that a lot of things we are doing should be put on hold because of the COVID pandemic. But we believe that we should not waste this crisis, but we should continue to build resilience. We should continue to move forward because we believe there is light at the end of the tunnel with this COVID pandemic that we are suffering from today. And we have seen indications that things will improve, but it will take time for us to eventually get there. And so it is programs like these that gives us hope that all is not lost. The climate risk for us in St. Lucia and in the Caribbean is an existential risk which threatens to collectively wipe us off from the face of the earth. And we, we need to understand that one major natural disaster, one tsunami, anything. Because now, I mean, when you look at what is happening globally, we had almost an entire month of non-stop rain. I cannot recall the last time we had that level of consistency of rainfall in St. Lucia. And every day you think you can try and predict what the weather is going to be, we get another surprise from something. And all of that is impacting us. In closing, I wish to thank the Green Climate Fund for providing the resources under the readiness and proprietary support to develop the country's program, among other things. Additionally, we received notification recently that St. Lucia has been approved for 662,000 US dollars for a second readiness, which will further strengthen and complement our effort to climate adaptation and climate mitigation. And we have to try and do both. Even though our contribution is minimal to green gas emissions, whatever we can do to go green is still necessary. And also as Minister of Housing, I've had discussions with the SLDB and we are looking at some of the housing projects to make them self-sufficient in energy generation, which is green energy. And these are the ways that we need to be looking at things in moving forward. I would like also to thank the Department of Sustainable Development, who has become a strategic partner in our fight against climate change as well as the Commonwealth Secretariat through Ms. Ruth Phillips, the Climate Finance Advisor posted here in St. Lucia. Also, we acknowledge the contribution made by all stakeholders, including the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, as well as the Climate Analytics of, for assisting in preparing the country program. To all I say again, thank you. May God bless you and let us enjoy the holiday season while keeping safe. I thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Minister. And um, let us thank Honorable Guy Joseph, Minister for Responsibility for Economic Development, Transport, Civil Aviation, Housing, Urban Renewal, and Telecommunications. So, Minister, Minister, at least today you know that it's added. Um, Minister mentioned very important, some very important points, and I just highlighted a few to, to bring out, that as SIDS, we have the smallest carbon footprint, but we have the greatest impact. The greatest impact of climate change is felt by us. And so, again, this is why we're here, why we're discussing why so many stakeholders are important, and we're all in this. And we need to build with greater resilience in mind. And that's our infrastructural projects, our private homes. And I'm looking straight at SLDB because SLDB is going to help champion this for us as well. And um, creating greater energy ge generation from the projects that we're going to develop. We have a video presentation that hopefully will capture a lot of what is being said here today. And it'll be a creative piece. And we invite you to view the screens while um, the presentation will be played. It is not the crisis of the 21st century and addressing it is both urgent and expensive across the globe. Over 279 million tons of ice have been lost since 2002, according to NASA. Over the past 30 years, frequency and intensity of hurricanes have amplified and global sea levels have risen by over three inches since 1993. St. Lucia has not been spared by Mother Nature's wrath. Flooding, longer droughts, and a coastline overtaken by the sea is today's reality. Minimizing human vulnerability to environmental changes is largely determined by the extent to which societies can develop and organize themselves to manage the impacts from hazardous events or disturbance trends in social, economic, and environmental systems. It is important to note that natural climate variability is not attributable to or influenced by any activity related to humans. A prominent aspect of our climate is variability. This variability ranges over many time and space scales and includes phenomena such as El Nino, La Nina, droughts, multi-year, multi-decade, and even multi-century changes in temperature and precipitation patterns. Cognizant of the medium and long-term impacts of climate change, the government of St. Lucia has adopted a strategic approach. We are building in a different style, in a different format in St. Lucia. So you would have seen the solar farm that was established down in, at Uranura. The, this is a 3 megawatt. We are in the process of working on another 10 megawatt facility. And all of these projects are geared towards not just reducing our carbon footprint, but making St. Lucia more ready for uh, benefits that can be derived from climate resilience. Climate change aggravates existing problems such as inequality, discrimination, and poverty. This is why climate finance should be targeted to help vulnerable populations. Under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the international community has agreed that industrialized countries who were the biggest contributors to greenhouse gas pollution should support climate projects in developing countries. These financial transfers are often multilateral climate funds, the largest of which is the Green Climate Fund. It has only been operational since 2015, yet it has funded more than 100 projects. These projects help communities to adapt to the effects of climate change and transition to clean energy production. There, there are different modalities of accessing funding under the GCF, so you've got readiness support, which essentially seeks to strengthen the institutional capacity of the country uh, to engage with the, the GCF. Uh, for St. Lucia, as well as other countries, 
the GCF um, institutes what you call a national designated authority, which is our ministry. As one of the modalities, you've got readiness support, which is to strengthen um, the, the NDA to be able to do so. But there's also project facilitation as well as funding proposals. The objective of St. Lucia's GCF readiness support initiated in 2018 is to strengthen the institutional structures to ensure the efficient, effective and transparent use of climate finance resources and assist in the design of adaptation and mitigation interventions that lead to transformative and impactful results. We have our pipeline of projects through the country program that span the sectors of water and agriculture and fisheries and tourism and infrastructure and education and health and tourism as well as transport and energy and, and working with them and with the pipeline we have currently we have a, a water project with the green climate fund in approximately 10 million us dollars um, that we are trying to get accepted for the funding we are expecting to be able to submit another very shortly in terms of fisheries another in health as well, as well as another to help us with our nationally determined contribution, which is a, a, a document or a piece that countries develop to help them indicate how they will actively try to in, reduce emissions. St. Lucia is positioned to benefit from the GCF with a slate of climate change mitigation and adaptation initiatives. One is the Castries Vision 2030, uh, so there is a, a program, a proposal, that we are in the process of submitting to the GCF that would make a contribution in that area involving electric mobility, uh, energy conservation, as well as building resilience uh, around the seafront in Castries. Our approach is that we are asking the GCF funds to support us in what we call a green affordable housing program and this program is really look, assisting the government with the rollout of its housing both mixed use and social housing for 11 communities and the intention really is to use those funds to first of all encourage persons to move from low-lying areas the persons in ancillary in denry in Soufre, in all of those areas where they are prone to flooding, Bexor, we want them to now look at these housing communities as being an alternative to where they live. As a new fund, the GCF tries to learn from the mistakes of other organizations where climate projects had harmful consequences such as environmental degradation or human rights violations. The fund aims to take a rounded approach, not just financing climate action, but also supporting social and economic development reducing emissions and addressing the impacts of climate change. The country program of climate action which St. Lucia has developed helps chart a part of national development in prioritizing what needs to be done and also provides DCF with an invaluable guide on how we should direct our climate finance support. The Caribbean Community Climate Change Center plays a vital role in implementing DCF's readiness and preparatory support in St. Lucia. It is my hope that with the help of the five Cs, St. Lucia would use the DCF's readiness funding to institutionalize climate change interventions as an integral part of its national development agenda. To date, St. Lucia has benefited from $17.3 million in green climate funding to improve the Eastern Caribbean engagement with the GCF, address issues pertaining to project development, data and information gaps, public-private engagement, and to facilitate and support the participation of non-stakeholders in project identification and development. The funds have also been used to improve Sedema's early warning system readiness, to support the development of a credit risk abatement facility and for CARICOM states and mainstream coral resilience and restoration of an eco-based adaptation strategy to climate change in the Caribbean region.
the GCF is well placed to continue supporting St. Lucia, not only with financing, but also by providing technical guidance. We encourage St. Lucia and other small island developing states to make use of every resource that GCF can provide to bolster society's ability to adapt to climate effects while enhancing national climate ambition and action. The GCF has committed to protecting and promoting human rights and funded projects are supposed to be gender responsive and respect the rights of women and indigenous people by requiring consultation with them, as well as remaining committed to accountability and transparency to all donor partners and fund recipients. The GCF's continued investment in building the region's climate resilience is critical. Such investments must now be scaled up. The Five Cs is ready to use its experience, its know-how, and its strong partnership with the Green Climate Fund to mobilize the financing necessary to improve the Caribbean's resilience to climate change. financing, but technical assistance, so it's a lot of hand-holding to ensure that this is successful. We now have a, a short presentation uh, to the Minister, the hard copy document of um, St. Lucia's country program to the GCF. So we invite the Minister, yes, to come to the front, and the PS will make that presentation. <laughs> Yes, the camera is out. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Minister doesn't forget his protocols. <laughs> okay, so we actually now have a more interactive. As the minister said earlier, you know the you can't see faces, so I don't know how he saw your face was gloomy, but he saw your mask. Um, but we now have the audience. They, the, the eyes, you didn't have smiling eyes, he said. So we invite um, some questions, and actually we, we have Mr. Tommy Descartes who will be hopefully responding to a number of them. So we have the audience who will participate. And I think all the way to the back, um, we have our first, no, Mr. Vincent, I think you wanted to be first because you know you have the money. <laughs> and it's going to be important that you ask that first question. So we invite um, Mr. Vincent Bolin. Good morning all, thank you very much. Um, my question this morning is, today marks the launching of the St. Lucia's country program under the Green Climate Fund. Why is having a country program important? And while you're at it, tell us who guides the development of this process. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Boland, for that question. I think that the, um, uh, the gentleman from GCF in the video uh, made a very key point that this is really a guide to the GCF first and foremost in terms of what our priorities and how our priorities align to the climate challenges that we face as a country. But also there are a number of uh, stakeholders in the space. There are a lot of accredited entities um, um, that are willing to support countries like St. Lucia in accessing the Green Climate Fund, and they too need to be aware of what are the priorities of St. Lucia. Uh, and so essentially, um, it must show how it's aligned to GCF's investment criteria. In, GCF has a very um, 
robust investment criteria that must show how uh, their investment in St. Lucia, and I think invest, and they use the word investment, it's not just handing money, but it's an investment in building our adaptation as a country, but also our contribution to mitigation efforts. Uh, and it must be transformative. And so um, the country program shows our portfolio of, of um, nationally, well, national projects, nationally approved projects that I, I, we would want to see on the ground, but how we access other um, funds from the GCF, like the readiness and your project preparation facility funding and so on. So, so this is a guide and very, very importantly, it must be aligned to national, the national priorities of the, the, the country and there must be broad-based stakeholder um, buy-in uh, for, for this. So th this is the, the ethos of having a, a country program which will guide us. Um, interestingly, it's, it's, it's aligned with our medium-term development strategy cycle, four years. And so we, sorry, we are hoping that once um, that is done, then we now go for another cycle. It's a living document, in, uh, and and we hope that um, as, change, as things change, um, we can we, it can be reflected. Likewise, we're, before we did, uh, this process started before, uh, pre-pandemic, and we had to now fa factor in the pandemic in in this in the country program. Thank you, Mister. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Yeah. I said it's a living document. Do we have another question? I think from Health. Um, Jackie, let's welcome her to the mic. Hi, in the presentations before us, um, you indicated that this has been a very consultative pro a process involving a number of stakeholders. Could you just highlight some of the key sectors involved and some of the key um, target activities within each sector? Yeah, thanks, thanks for that question. The, the GCF really um, em emphasizes the importance of stakeholder consultation. And so um, the process was one that was very, very consultative. And we had a number of, of, of um, engagements at the community level, uh, at the various ministries, the private sector, civil society organizations. So, so that every person's or every sector of, the, of a country voice would be heard in, the, in this process. Um, the GCF again looks at both mitigation and adaptation, and so a lot of our initiatives and the sectors rather focused around that. So the water is a particular area of concern for us. Um, fisheries and marine life and the ecosystems is, is critical. Um, the issue around the housing and green affordable housing, forestry. Um, you know, we also looked at on the mitigation side, energy efficiency and, and um, renewable energy, and um, uh, the whole energy mix. I see, Mr. Mr. Gillard. Here and, and it also complements the work from the national energy tra uh, energy transition strategy. Um, so, so it's really it really comes in to, to look at what work is already on the ground, how we can scale up and complement, and, and not 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 duplicate in any way what's already happening. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I also need to say health. Health. I mean, you asked from health, so <laughs> <laughs> certainly health is, is in there. Um, I, my apologies. My, <laughs> we've, we were one of the first countries to actually, I think, you know, to really push the importance of health. Um, now, you know, that was pre-pandemic as to, to benefit from the GCF. And I know that Power has started some work around the smart, um, smart health facilities. And we want to scale that up uh, through the Green Climate Fund, so that every single health facility in San Lucia will be will meet that particular criteria and that sort of climate resilience. So sorry for for, for, for getting the health. Um, yeah, as as we here. said, it's all stakeholders. Everyone is involved. And um, talking about everyone is involved, we have Mr. Barnard who wanted to ask a question. And I know he has two hats. I know he's um, both with the bank and also the private sector. But I think you want to go more on your private sector hat. <laughs> so just uh, please come to. Mike? Good morning, all. Um, morning. Just here, yeah, but want to make sure that our participants virtually get the audio as well, so just begin to yes. Good morning, all. It's uh, fantastic to see the minister and his team um, showing such enthusiasm for this program. Um, during the presentation, um, we've heard of many sectors, and I'm following on from the question that preceded, which sectors are going to be prioritized? Which are ones are going to see prior attention in this program? Thank you, Thank Thank you. you Mr. Bernard. Um, so the sectors and the GCF, uh, well, the National um, Designated Authority um, really takes its lead from 
uh, a lot of the, the stakeholder engagement. And one of the areas I think that um, the Department of Sustainable Development, I think the PS articulated, they would have done a lot of assessments, um, their NAPs, their SASAPs, and so on, on the critical areas. And, and they actually highlighted that these are the areas that, that, that would need that sort of support. So I think now there is a, a, about seven, six or seven areas in our health, education, um, agriculture, water, um, fisheries, all of which there are national adaptation plans for these. And so the GCF through the country program really uses this as a guide in terms of the sectors. But more importantly, it's, it's really there must be a sort of perceived, nationally perceived need for that particular sector. Um, and also the policy buying at the high level, uh, right, which I think is very critical in order for us to push through these, these projects. A critical point is the climate rationale. I think for us is the issue of how do we show clearly to the GCF that there is a clear challenge on the ground, a climate challenge, and how is this particular project going to uh, respond to that? So, so that, is the, that is a fundamental, I do know from the private sector, and um, one of the areas I think we've, in our first readiness, uh, we didn't so much engage the private sector, but in readiness two, which was recently approved, there is a deliberate effort on our part to engage the private sector. Um, and, and so uh, it's just, uh, you look forward to, to more engagement from, our, from us to, to the private sector. Um, so, so certainly, that, but these are the areas that we are open to focus on. Thank you for that. And we have another question from our audience, from Kenisha. And Kenisha is from Nemo. And so mm. Nemo would like to know how they're involved as well. A lot. Um, <laughs> and you know, we talk about resilience, we talk about um, global warming, and anything that happens in the country in terms yeah. of a disaster, yeah. Nemo is yeah. at the forefront. So yeah. I invite you to ask your question. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, I've heard many complaints about how earnest the Green Climate Fund processes and how long it takes to access the funds. Um, you mentioned earlier that the cycle for this current program is four years. Um, what are some of the key projects in St. Lucia's country program for this cycle? And importantly, which ones do we, do we expect to submit to the GCF in that period? Uh, thank you, Kenisha. Um, before I even answer that question, I do want to also say that while the, in our country program there's not a, a dedicated project to NEMO, we have um, supported regional initiatives um, through, uh, through CDEMA to help um, help with NEMO. Um, so in terms of the, the projects, um, I, well, the issue, the issue of how onerous it is to access, um, I don't know, I, I, we have Orville Gray on the call, so I don't I want to say, say too much to that, but, but safe to say that um, I think uh, the, the process of engaging the GCF um, the GCF one is insisting that there is impact, it's, transform it's, it's transformative, and so, so they are ensuring that we, um, we, can, we can substantiate uh, a particular project and there's a clear rationale for that project. Um, and so for us at the end, it, it has been a steep learning curve, understanding the GCF, um, not just the GCF, I mean, understanding climate science and, and so on. It's, it's a, I, I tell you, I mean, it's almost as a, a university for us. We're always learning something new around, around the, the area. Um, but I, I must say that the GCF recognizes that and they have used readiness resources to help build capacity of the NDAs so that we can fully understand what is expected of the NDA. So, so part of the readiness one, which included the development of this country program, there was a development of a number of knowledge products that the NDA um, would, would be able to use in engaging the, the private sector and so on. So, so we do hope that uh, through this cycle, at least we've, we have gone past at least the most steep part of the learning curve and we can now continue to, to be able to engage them a lot better. In terms of the projects, we have about, f I think, five projects that are in there. We have a water project, which is a, nationally, well, a national water project that um, the CDB is, is leading on. And um, it's the, the concept has been developed. It has been submitted to the GCF, and we're hoping to to get this project off the ground. It it is it it, it, it deals with energy efficiency in the in the water sector. Uh, as most of you are aware, um, the energy component is one of the biggest costs that the, the the utility has to deal with. So, um, 
and all, building the overall resilience of the sector. I see, you know, in a hurricane, you have a lot of water, but it damages your, your water infrastructure, and then all of a sudden you have a, a water crisis on your hands. So, um, so certainly water, and, and Wasco is, is represented here. We, we're looking at the fishery sector to strengthen the fishery sector. There, there's a big talk about blue economy and marine economy and so on. I mean, if you don't have a, a, a good, healthy, um, um, you know, um, well, ocean, then you could forget about the blue economy. So I think it's critical that 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 we ensure that we we can, um, you know, benefit from that. The Castries low um, low carbon um, initiative, which PS in his, in the audiovisual spoke to, um, again it piggies back on on uh, the national uh, the NIP National Integrated Planning and Program Unit work, which is to the, the overall development of Castries, and we are now coming in to complement that. Um, and to go into modal shift, EVs, and so on, um, you know, so, and I can't not see the green affordable housing if Mr. Vincent Boland's sitting right in front of me, um, you know, which is an initiative to um, to pretty much uh, develop a, a new housing that integrates green energy and so on, but also factors in the, the issue of the risk that low coastlines uh, pose to households and, and citizens. So. So to, uh, this is a, the, the portfolio of projects, and we have a number of other readiness, uh, regional readiness initiatives that we are partnering to. So uh, we do hope that um, we can see these, maybe one or two. I, 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 I have to be uh, a bit cautious, cautiously ambitious here. Eh? Maybe one or two of these, suddenly I, I could see the, the water project going through, um, and perhaps the, the fisheries one. I know Mr. M Mr. Boland is may not be, be too happy for that, but it, it takes a quite quite some time to move move this through. So, um, and and if there are any legal issues, Mr. Boland, and and so on, then you know these will certainly be um, um, uh, sort of will hamstrung the process. So, but I'm just saying that's that's me here. We c these things could change rather quickly. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I guess Nemo, if building more resilience, that means that you'll have less work in time of disaster. <laughs> and Tommy, you mentioned quite a bit of energy efficiency and um, the various sectors. And um, we actually have a question from um, Terence, who is from Infrastructure and uh. Energy. And he's very much interested in um, this particular activity. And he has a question for you. All right. So we invite him to the mic. Good morning, Mr. Good morning. colleagues. Good morning, Good morning. Minister Good morning. Um, let, let, let me commend the Ministry of um, economic development for the tremendous work you have done, of course, with the support of critical stakeholders like Sustainable Development and ourselves. Yeah. Um, I was very pleased when Minister spoke about the 10 megawatt solar farm to be um, installed in, in Trumase. But what we have seen over the past year or so is that a few of these very important projects have suffered tremendous delays as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, um, mm -hmm. she, we just heard about the processes and, and the delays and how onerous the processes may be for, for accessing green climate fund um, resources. So my question to you, Mr. Tommy, is is COVID-19 having an impact on, on accessing the GCF funds? And if yes, what are these impacts and what measures are you taking to, to, to mitigate? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gillard. Thank you. Uh, so I would like to say also that um, while COVID is a pandemic, climate change is a pandemic in itself. Um, and my, how I view um, COVID, I see COVID as an accelerator. So a lot of persons, you know, well, there may be a certain slowing, but I see COVID as an accelerator. And I know that there's a global recognition that this recovery offers us an opportunity to uh, well, this 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 COVID offers us an opportunity to recover with with uh, with a focus on green, the green economy and so on. And I think that the GCF is is very much aware of that, and and they are certainly pushing this. And um, and so it's my it's my anticipation that the GCF will um, up the ante, and likewise we will up the ante in terms of ensuring that we can. Um, we can uh, accelerate the pace at which we, we, we push certain, certain initiatives like energy and so on. So I, I see COVID as a, 
in my mind, it's, it's really an accelerator. Uh, stuff that we would have taken 10 to 15 years to do. COVID is saying that there's absolutely no way that you can continue to delay on these. And so I, um, I think it's a tremendous opportunity that COVID presents to us as, as, a, as a country and as a region to accelerate um, these initiatives. Yeah, excellent. I think, as has been said over and over, COVID, COVID is a mixed bag. You know, they, it's not all bad. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, as you said, it's an accelerator. Um, well, this segment is almost, is almost done, but any last words, any other points that you'd like to raise? Well, I, I think, certainly I think I, I would want to just lend my voice to those who have gone before me to thank all the stakeholders who have contributed to, to us getting thus far. Um, energy, sustainable development, who have been invaluable partners in this process. I, I mean, uh, admittedly, I mean, at economic development, uh, we're really learning on the job where, where climate change is concerned. You know, the, the expertise really rely, rely with energy and, and sustainable development that we forge a very strong relationship there. Um, and we are looking to, to forge further relationships. We see the NIP, uh, WASCO, and, you know, um, and so I, we will be working very closely with all these agencies to implement this. Right now, it's really an, an issue of implementing the, the SLDB. And, and from today's launch really shows that there is high level po policy um, buy-in from this, you know. And so we are now about to, we have, give, we have been given our marching orders essentially. And so we'll now be uh, pushing ahead um, in terms of the implementation. Um, we, we know that this, year, the, the, this decade is what is called the decade of action, you know, and I think we need to get, get, get down to action and, and bring about that sort of transform, transformative um, green uh, uh, mitigation adaptation development to our country. It's essential that we, we do this now, if ever. So thank you, Glenn. Thank you. So let's give Mr. Tommy Descartes a round of applause. Tommy is the chief economist and the focal point for the Green Climate Fund. I think, Tommy, your focal point, you did an excellent job. <laughs> I tried. So um, we move on with the program. And we now invite um, our, uh, another virtual presenter, Dr. Inka Grandison from Canary. And she's the Senior Technical Officer and Project Manager. And she'll be starting seg segment two, which is the enhancing and she'll be doing the project overview, um, enhancing Caribbean civil society access and readiness to climate finance. Welcome. Good morning. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I think I have a few slides. I'm just going to check whether I need to project them or whether you will be projecting them. So I. Uh, the IT team, she will project it. Yeah. Okay. So, see if you could share your screen. Okay, we'll do. Good. We've, we're seeing you. Okay. All right. So, good morning, everybody. Um, permit me to adopt um, all protocols that have already been established. Um, and say greetings from sunny Trinidad um, on behalf of the Caribbean Natural Resources Institute, Canary. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to introduce the project Enhancing Caribbean Civil Society's Access and Readiness for Climate Finance and to announce the national launch today in St. Lucia along with the launch of the GCF Country Program in partnership with the Department of Economic Development transport and civil aviation. As the GCF country program is being launched, including an innovative pipeline of projects for investment, I think it is an opportune time for us to reflect on the need for civil society leadership in taking urgent action to address the climate crisis and recognize that government and the private sector cannot tackle the crisis alone. Caribbean civil society organizations have been actively involved in addressing climate change via raising awareness, advocacy for changes in policy and practice. For example, the well-known campaign on 1.5 to stay alive, led by Panos Caribbean, 
and implementing practical actions to adapt and mitigate climate change. However, CSOs do face a number of challenges in taking action as their efforts are often small scale, short term, and disconnected from government and private sector efforts, and they lack the necessary funding and technical assistance. So this project's goal is really to address these challenges and enhance civil society's capacity, including the knowledge, skills, and organizational structures of national NGOs, nonprofits, and community-based organizations and networks to access and deliver climate finance in the Caribbean. And it seeks to enhance the enabling institutions so that civil society has voice and can actively participate in climate adaptation and mitigation and building resilience nationally and regionally. The project was developed in collaboration with national authorities and leading CSOs across the region with Jamaica's Climate Change Division serving as the lead and six other authorities are project partners, including the Department of Economic Development, Transport and Civil Aviation in St. Lucia. Canary serving as the implementing entity um, for this project, which is funded by a US 1.29 million grant from the GCF Readiness Program. The project is being implemented over 30 months from February 2020 to August 2022. And the main target groups clearly are CSOs at the community, national and regional levels, but we're also going to be working with national designated authorities, NDs, and accredited entities, the GCF. The project is regional in scope, as I said, covering all the CARICOM member states with targeted activities in seven countries, including Antigua and Barbuda, Belize, Grenada, Jamaica, St. Kitts and Nevis, Suriname, and St. Lucia. There are four key components which we'll be focusing on. One, strengthening mechanisms for civil society engagement and consultation in decision-making at the national and regional levels. Two, increasing uptake of innovative climate change solutions among civil society organizations and their partners to scale up impact and better address climate change. With a focus on community-based and ecosystem-based solutions that build socioeconomic and ecological resilience. Three, strengthening the capacity of CSOs to directly access and deliver climate finance through the GCF and other funds. And four, enhancing awareness and actions to integrate civil society-led interventions and strengthen the overall pipeline of projects to the GCF. This includes developing at least two project concepts with CSOs to access funding from the GCF. In terms of project activities over the next year, well, in September, we kicked off a regional scoping study to collect information on current levels of civil society engagement and access to climate finance, including a focus on St. Lucia, and we're mapping civil society-led climate initiatives to identify best practices and innovations to scale up. This month, we're also doing the national launch in St. Lucia. In the coming months, we'll be developing a toolkit and online training module to support civil society capacity building and begin rolling out training in mid-2021. We're also planning to host a regional dialogue on civil society's readiness for climate finance and launch a learning network in February 2021. We had hoped this dialogue would be in person um, to really facilitate partnership building among civil society groups and the public and private sector across the CARICOM region. But unfortunately, as you all know, with COVID-19, um, that's not going to be possible. So it will be virtual. Finally, we are developing civil society engagement guidelines that actually will build on some of the innovative work that was done in developing St. Lucia's ND toolkit um, and also training up national designated authorities and accredited entities to GCF on these guidelines and then supporting national capacity building workshops, including in St. Lucia, and the creation of a civil society climate action team to coordinate and enable joint action among the different groups. 
all of this work is being managed by Canary as the implementing entity for the project, and the team includes myself as project manager. We're working closely with the Department of Economic Development, Transport, and Civil Aviation as the key project partner, as I said, as they are the national designated authority to the GCF, as well as the Department of Sustainable Development as the climate change focal point. And we're very happy to have on board Right Angle Imaging, or REI, as the National Coordinator and Civil Society Liaison in St. Lucia. So before I went wrapped up, I wanted to actually quickly say a few words about Canary for those of you who are not familiar with us. We are a regional CSO and therefore have a vested interest in supporting civil society. As a non-profit technical institute, we have worked for over 30 years in the region. Previously, we were based in St. Lucia, but now we're based out of Trinidad. Our mission is to promote and facilitate stakeholder participation and the stewardship of natural resources across the Caribbean. Our work centers on four themes, biodiversity and ecosystems, equity, participatory governance, and resilience. And under our resilience work, we focus on building the resilience of communities, their livelihoods and ecosystems to climate change and disasters through capacity building, research, policy influencing, and improving governance and access to finance. This project on enhancing civil society's leadership and capacity to access and deliver climate finance is therefore central to our work on our objectives to build local resilience. I'm very excited to be supporting implementation in St. Lucia and across the CARICOM region. So that's it for my overview. If you have any questions on the project, you can ask myself or the RAI team, who will be very happy to answer them. And you can also check out the project webpage and brief using the URL shown on the slide. Thank you very much for your time. And as I said, we're really looking forward to moving um, forward and making this project a success and working closely with CSOs and governments and other partners in Tunisia. Thank you. Thank you. A round of applause for Dr. Aker Grandison. And I, I see within your slide, I'm just pulling out one of the, the headings that you have there, that Canary Resilience Focus, and that's for an entire century, 2020 to 30, 30, <laughs> more, than, it's more than a century. That's beautiful. That means that we're definitely moving in the direction. Is that, was it that? Uh, is that millennium? Yeah, it's so <laughs> that is, we're definitely on the right track with that. Um, we have one change to our program. I think the audience has already asked questions, so we will not um, do this part. But we have two PSAs that we would like to unveil, and we uh, ask the IT team to allow for us to be able to visualize them. And if you look at the screen, take a look at what you'll be seeing played on social media and on the television screens for the next few months coming up. Once upon a time, in a small island developing state, the people lived at the mercy of more developed countries where the cars were smoky and plentiful where trees were chopped for firewood, where factory fumes clogged the air. As the industrialized countries polluted, the effects on the earth became more visible, especially for islands like ours. Droughts became longer, hurricanes became stronger, rivers overflowed their banks, and the days became much hotter. The adults recognized their destructive pattern and soon, collectively, larger countries started to work together to make Mother Earth greener to live. This proved not only difficult, but very costly. So, they came together and developed a Green Climate Fund to support efforts of developing countries like St. Lucia to respond to the challenges of climate change. Yes? So, did they just give countries money to solve the problem? Well, yes and no. They developed a well-organized plan to help countries mitigate and adapt to climate change. Yes? Lisa, do you really mean? I was hoping you'd ask. To 
find out more, log on to www.greenfinance.fund. So this will be what's going on. And these are some bright children. They're using them big words, mitigate, and all those <laughs> other things, you know? So, <laughs> and I like that type of teacher. Send them to the internet from early, you know? So thanks for that round of applause for the effort and the work that's being done. So I know that we've been here a while, and we've gotten almost to the end. We have one more batsman, and we bring um, Ms. Donet Chalry who has been working hard, who accosted me in the hallway to tell me that I'm doing this today, and I had no choice. So now she has no choice but to give you the final vote of thanks. We invite her to the podium. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I wish to commend you all for availing yourselves to celebrate with us, both physically and virtually. It is indeed my great pleasure and honor to witness the launch of this significant document, not only in my capacity as a member of the Department of Economic Development, Transport and Civil Aviation, which is also the national designated authority to the GCF, but also as a citizen of St. Lucia. St. Lucia's Country Program is a bold step in further cementing our relationship with the GCF. And as the Permanent Secretary and our Minister rightly said, it outlines an ambitious portfolio of national and regional projects, as well as readiness initiatives that St. Lucia will be engaging the GCF over the next four years. This document is a living document, meaning it will be periodically revised and updated to reflect the national circumstances and altered or changed whenever necessary. The country program was developed through extensive consultations with multi-sectoral representatives from public institutions, private, in sorry, financial institutions, the private sector, civil society, and international actors, just to name a few. As stated in the country program, Readiness support has been prioritized to strengthen information gaps and to facilitate the advancement of the associated concept notes geared towards final submission. And I would like to put all of you here on high alert because as was mentioned by the PS and the minister, we recently got approval for a second readiness entitled Enhancing St. Lucia's Understanding capacity, institutional and strategic frameworks to access climate finance for low emission climate resilient pathways. It is a mouthful, sorry. <laughs> so we will be contacting you in the near future and also as part of the project enhancing Caribbean civil society's access and readiness to climate finance uh, in order to facilitate the necessary stakeholder processes. The successful launch of this country program was not without its challenges. We at the department had every intention of pulling this off earlier this year, several times. However, COVID-19 had other plans. I am sure everyone in here, in person and online, can attest to the various trials, tribulations, and in some instances, the triumphs experienced as a result of this virus. As we grapple with the many worldwide changes, we must continue to mitigate risk and minimize the spread, all while maintaining social and economic activities. Of utmost importance, however, is the fact that climate change and its adverse effects have not stopped, nor slowed down, because of the global pandemic. Therefore, we in our different capacities 
need to continue our collaborative efforts to mitigate the spread, also while keeping our eyes on the prize of keeping global warming well below the two degrees Celsius threshold when compared to pre-industrial levels. It is against this background that I now make special mention of the various people and or organizations without whose support today would not have been possible. To the regional and by extension, the wider GCF network. I say thank you for your dedication to climate action. Thank you for your support to small island developing states like St. Lucia. Thank you for recognizing the need to mobilize financial resources to assist those already cash strapped countries in their fight to limit or reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to adapt to, to the unavoidable impacts of climate change. Special mention must be made of Dr. Gray, Mahendra, Ali, Naranda. We appreciate your cooperative attitudes, patience, and quick response times. To the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, or Five Cs as we normally refer to them, we thank you for your continued support, not only to St. Lucia, but to the wider Caribbean, as we attempt to address the impact of climate variability and change. Vincent, I'm sure you would have been here in the audience had it not been for COVID. Sincere gratitude goes out to Climate Analytics for putting the document together, especially because of the many frustrations encountered. Fran, Paolo, special thanks to you, as I know you would have loved to be here to celebrate with us. To our colleagues from the Department of Sustainable Development, I don't think there are words to aptly express our gratitude for your seemingly never-ending support, assistance, and cooperation. Mistress Leo, Dawn, Shana, we were sad to see you go. Thank you. We are especially grateful to our Commonwealth fi Climate Finance Advisor, Ruth Phillips Itty. You have proven to be an invaluable member of our team. To all the staff of the Department of Economic Development, other government and non-governmental organizations, regional and international organizations, special mention of WMO, which is the World Meteorological Organization, to everyone who contributed to the development of St. Lucia's country program to the GCF, to Dr. Granderson for her insightful presentation, our facilitator in the name of Glenn Simon, the GIS team who helped, to make today a who helped make today a success, we would like to say thank you, merci, muchísimas gracias. <laughs> to all those who were able to join us in person, special thanks to you. And to those viewing online, your presence is greatly appreciated. I would like to conclude with a quote by Ted Turner, and I quote, while the problems can sometimes seem overwhelming, we can turn things around. But first, we must move beyond climate action. We must move behind climate talk to climate action. Thank you. And um you know the person who normally does the vote of thanks and the, the closing remarks never gets to thank themselves or else you tell them there. So let us say, thank Dodette. And she has, as Tommy has explained, she has coordinated this activity and worked very, very hard. And um, even when you leave, you pull your pointing at somebody. Who else? Oh, IT didn't get thanked? IT never gets thanked, you know, they always do these things. IT, round of applause for IT, <laughs> making the connections for us virtually as well. So even when you leave, I was saying that um, Dorlet and the team um, have prepared packages for you so that you could not forget that this launch took place and that the, through the messaging of the marketing content, it'll go further and go to your homes. And um, let me also recognize um, right angle imaging in here, Barbara. Jacob Small and um, 
The common man needs to understand the importance of this activity today. It's not good enough for us to do it because we're the converted. We know and we're sold. But they need to understand how they get involved. And I know that Barbara is going to help very intimately in breaking down the information and telling persons what SIDS are and how they could get involved and um, the like. So it leaves me now to thank you um, for being here. Thanks for your presence. Thanks for, I think, a very wonderful ceremony and for wishing you all the best. As the minister said, we're in the festive season. All the best as we draw closer to Christmas season. Thank you and have a wonderful day. There are some refreshments and packages outside as you leave. Thank you.